next speaker now is an Italian sociologist and one of the pioneers in retail and in the consumer's good industry. She's been advising international companies on brand management, communication, innovation, project development such as IKEA. Professor of Design Management and Humanistic Marketing in Sweden at the University of Bora. She's also visiting professor at the London College of Fashion. She's a member of the advisory board of the IG IHT, the Gottlieb Dudweiler Institute in Zurich. Please welcome Professor Simonetta Carbonaro. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure, such a honor, and uh, such a fun also to be here today. Thank you for having invited me. So, uh, I have a lot of things that I want to tell you. Um, time is the tyrant, so let me start right away. So, what I am, yeah, you already heard, you know, actually the back my background is consumer co uh, psychology and especially consumer psychology. I've been working for the last 20, 25 years for many companies in the consumer good industry. But actually, you, mo you know, I consider, you know, a very important source of uh, my insight, you know, what I'm doing at the university with people like you. You know, I have uh, the, the, the honor of uh, being able to stay with these young people coming from all over the world uh, and uh, being actually... Oh! You see, because otherwise I will start to pantomime, you know, that's what we <laughs> usually are supposed to <laughs> look at. But anyway, you know, in, in terms of this picture, I don't need to show it because you, you, you just look at yourself, you know, fantastic people coming from all over the world, uh, exactly in the time in which, you know, from now neurosciences, uh, we got the possibility to talk and to interact with the most intelligent people, you know, on the planet. And also, you know, coming with different back uh, backgrounds, you know, and this is uh, something that I like very much. You know, I, the, the, the master students that we teach to are, that actually we are in relationship with, are have uh, business and administration <laughs> backgrounds and, and starting, uh, and uh, and they are designers, of course. Uh, but they are also engi engineers and many other different backgrounds, also humanistic one coming from cultural studies. So it's fantastic, it's the real the utopia that I am allowed to be part of, of having finally, you know, this transdisciplinary reality, you know, being, you know, the one that uh, we can refer to and the one that is really probably the precondition for tackling the very heavy duty complexity of our times. So that was really also the beginning uh, of the story of uh, Domus Academy when I was uh, teaching at Domus Academy because actually the students uh, at Domus, the, the starting with the people that were called to teach there, you know, we were not designers. All of us, uh, you know, a majority were designers, but theoretical designers, so more thinkers than designers, philosophers and artists more than designers. And people like me, you know, they're just being a psychologist. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so, because of this uh, uh, transdisciplinary dimension that I was uh, uh, able to be part of, I, you know, I have my own definition of what uh, is a designer. A designer is uh, whoever is a change agent. Whoever is innovating, has this burning passions for being, you know, doing something different, something new. And uh, my approach that I see that both, uh, you know, in, co in terms of consultancy, but also in terms of uh, education works, is that of uh, seeing, starting with seeing the big, big picture. Then, of course, uh, envision what is your purpose in that big pi picture, and then of course, find the common ground with the others in order to, yeah, just, just go for transformation, transform the future by design. So that means seeing things, sometimes also with the eyes of your mind and your heart, not only with your eyes, think about it, uh, 
share you know, what uh, you are really seeing uh, around and transform. What I mean with transformative design is both. On one side, you know, is the incremental innovation that we can add uh, by making every day everything we do better, which is very honorable, very important. But on the other side, there is a moment in which you can really make a quantum leap, go to a transformation that is really changing the paradigm of what exists around you. And of course, grow. Sorry, but I think that growth is embedded in our nature. We are part of nature. Nature needs growth. And I am not part, uh, I don't belong to the people that think uh, that we should uh, happily degrow, because that would make our societies, our civilization also end. It would be, from also a psychological point of view, what is uh, mostly making uh, would make us depressed because we need we need to feel that we can get better and better every day, and leave on also to the next generation the possibility to grow. But uh, it is true that I hardly criticize when growth is uh, the result of a linear thinking, you know, that is forced, you know, to just grow quantitatively. So I think, and I co call that com compulsive repetition, because it's not about uh, what is uh, all about design being uh, embedded into the, the, the passion for cy cyclic and regenerative processes, which are the one that nature teaches us are the, the, the processes that bring, you know, that give us a future. But it's, you know, instead of just uh, going for the more of the same, no? the vicious circle of the more of the same. And in that sense, we know already in the 70s, uh, when some of you were <laughs> not uh, already born, that we got warned, you know, of that kind of growth, you know, the, 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 the vicious circle of more of the same. There is an end, there is a limit that we have to, to, to be aware of. Scientists, especially in Sweden, we have fantastic scientists that are not just studying climate change, they are studying the planet resilience, the capability of the planet to, resi to resist and tackle with the footprint and the impact that human beings are, have, uh, the, our civilizations have put on it. And they tell us that already three of the nine boundaries uh, of resilience of our planet are really in a very scarce situation that has been uh, going uh, beyond, you know, what uh, the planet can, uh, can support, uh, can, can take in. And we know that the social <laughs> boundaries that allow us, you know, the social foundation uh, to keep the social foundation healthy, to, to, to guarantee to all uh, peace, social peace, uh, you know, are also in big trouble. We are, we are on our, our way, but, you know, there is a long way to temporary before we really can say the, that we have uh, created uh, a just uh, social foundation for all. So, uh, you know, since I was talking about transdisciplinary uh, I like to, to show you a model that uh, comes from the social studies, from the colleagues of uh, the social studies that I like very much. This is the Darcy Riddle and Michel Lemour. It was presented a uh, few years ago uh, at uh, the Transformation uh, um, Conference in Stockholm. So the model says and tells us uh, that the transformation happens uh, on big scale, of course, uh, when one is able to scale up the change. Scale up the change, um, uh, uh, up the change means uh, uh, impacting institution, changing politics, uh, policies, uh, rules, laws. And a very good example that makes me very, made me very optimistic uh, is the, in fact, uh, you know what, uh, the Sustainable uh, develop, uh, Development Goals of the United Nations put out as the next challenge for all of us. You know, as a very holistic approach uh, towards sustainability. Another small example, but uh, which I think, uh, you know, uh, can be the model, you know, for many other companies is this.
So, but the next dimension that we need uh, for real deep uh, transformation is to scale out. Scale out means, uh, you know, to impact the greater number of people. It's about dissemination, it's about replication, you know, of the good things that uh, we are designing. And I'm very optimistic also in that sense, very because there is a lot out there in terms of creativity devoted to the, to the development of what we call the circular economy. You know, think, for instance, at uh, the last book of uh, Paul Hawkins, you know, uh, 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 you know the, the, the hundreds of uh, very concrete solutions and computed and measured also in terms of impact that one can just put in, you know, disseminate. They are ready for the market. We don't have to wait for it. So there are so many also new startups and new design of new businesses around as never before. And so big and big also new product ideas as never before. So very optimistic. It can be, you know, the bicycle that cleans the air while you are going to the office. It can be the disruptive the use of the, uh, the, 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 the 3D uh, digital, no, 3D uh, uh, printing uh, that you can print uh, in a very next future, you know, whatever you think uh, is uh, necessary for your home or life at home uh, at home. Mm, but new kind uh, of disruptive ideas about, uh, you know, how to substitute plastic and, uh, you know, you know for sure the project of all water, which is just a membrane uh, that uh, encapsulates uh, the amount of water that you, you know, you want to have in your mouth to drink uh, and you can eat it. Uh, or, you know, the very interesting project that uh, at IKEA was done uh, with uh, Space uh, 10 uh, by investigating what is the future of food, what is the fu food of the future, and thinking about algae, or, you know, products idea, fantastic product idea of how to transform our waste at home in 24 hours into compost that you can put right away into into the, the, the soil of uh, your garden or your, 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 your plants at home. Or just even vi very little ideas, you know, that are just uh, nudging, no? as we say in design, you know, people to do the right thing and that they don't imply to change anything, but just giving the message. So there is a lot there in that sense uh, that give us hope in terms of the capability that we all have to scale out what we are doing. That makes sense. But mm. the third point that uh, really our colleagues uh, tell us uh, are really, you know, the one that uh, bring, you know, transformation, tr real deep transformation in action for durable change uh, is the transformation that uh, makes, uh, you know, people, hearts and minds shift into a new set of values, new cultural practices, and change no? the quality of the relationships among people. That is the scaling deep level. That is, I think, the most interesting one, the one that needs uh, all of us to work on it uh, more and, uh, and, and, and deeper. So my point, you know, I will bring you five points, uh, you know, that I think will help in going in that direction, which is uh, the first point is understand people's culture. Understanding it, keep it, people's culture is not just, you know, let's start with the Latins, because the wisdom of word is also a very good orientation tool. Comprehension in Latin meant take together, embrace. Uh, so uh, to comprehend people and the others, uh, no, it's not just about uh, sensing uh, others' emotions and feelings, because this is very important, but it's not enough, uh, because what it is really, you know, about comprehending people is understanding their spirit towards the future, their sense uh, of possibility, it is about uh, understanding and embracing people's aspirations, tuning with their ideals, co-designing their long-term hope and dream. This is actually something else than just understanding what are their concerns and finding solutions for their concerns. 
And if we are talking about the future, because this is the future, right? Then, you know, why not starting with <laughs> understanding, comprehending the very young people? So marketeers, <laughs> and uh, you know, I also mm, have to do a lot with marketing. Uh, you know, they they in, they are artists more than scientists. Let's say it. Uh, you know, I in the good sense of the word. They, you know, they package and they try to understand uh, in a very smart way what people out there think and uh, you know and, and and mean beyond what they are saying. But now there is a new package, which is the Gen uh, Z, uh, uh, Z uh, uh, generation uh, that uh, marketeers are very much aware of and very eager to understand. Of course, very simply, they are people probably also like you, born after 1995, two billion strong worldwide and growing. And they are not a younger version of the millennials. So. Of course, you know, there are many videos also online that you can listen to and watch in which, you know, marketers have collected the, the way that uh, these young people who represent our future, if we are talking about the future, think about uh, themselves. But I choose to show you a very short movie that a Gen Z generation mm, guy and an artist uh, who belongs to that generation made which I found much intriguing than the one that, uh, you know, marketeers would put together. Maybe I have to push something. No, it's here. Hi, Generation. Post-millennials. Generation Z. Who are we? Hi, my name is James. I'm Emily. Hi, my name is Emma. As a generation, I feel we are all tied as one. Lazy, lonely, technology possessed and unmotivated. I've never had the style or identity forced upon me. I've always been able to be who I want to be. My identity is constantly changing. Social media influences my every outfit, haircut and daily choices. Each brand I see on the pixels of my screen form an image an opinion, an identity in my head. I think to myself, is that who I want to be today? My decisions, influenced by the brands and promotion on social media. But do I sign in every day to look at these images, to watch these videos and feel okay about my identity? post that picture to Facebook if I don't look like the models. My being class is more like a you because all over Twitter he got an A star and she got a distinction. I can't wear this today. I don't look like she did on Instagram. Am I fat? Do I look ugly? Will I ever get good at this subject? Pressure. Social media creates unwanted pressure and impossible expectations. But I can't imagine life without it. It connects me to all of my friends and family, always in conversation, wherever I am and wherever they are. It opens up infinite opportunities for work and my future. I see technology as keys to open doors. It's a part of who I am. We are students, focused and ready to learn, preparing for work with diverse teams of people. We are performers, inspiring to act in the best theatres and dance on the best stages. 
We are the creators, looking to be the best in our fields and build a large audience and reputation. Motivated to get out there and create. Our generation is engulfed in opportunity created by the technology. Our generation is individual. Our generation is motivated. I am excited for the future, but we all know that if you don't speak up, you won't be heard. And that's okay, because we're shouting. So, not lazy, lonely, technology obsessed and unmotivated, because we are focused, we are ready to embrace diversity. Technology is a path to go ahead. We are the creators, we are excited for the future. We speak up, we are shouting. That's a fantastic, optimistic message, I think, uh, that is really indicating something beneath, uh, you know, what, what could be the next uh, stereotype about uh, this target group. Okay. But if we open a little bit up, uh, you know, the our spectrum of uh, the young people, okay, the World Economic Forum, uh, last uh, Global Shapers Annual Survey tells us uh, that uh, the three main uh, uh, concerns, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, of uh, people, young people from 18 and 35 are the climate change, number one, the large uh, scale conflict, wars, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the inequality, no? so the, the real ethical issue towards uh, uh, people that uh, don't have a decent life. And another thing that I find very interesting is that when they are asked, as far as your identity is concerned, what defines you most uh, is, uh, very simply, I am human, no? which is another interesting thing. Plus, it is really humbling to see how young people's empathy is in terms of social inclusion is, uh, is uh, uh, reminding our, us uh, that refugees are humans in need. 72.6% uh, would welcome refugees in their country. Okay, second point. Design counter trends. If you are innovators, why? Should we always look for mega trends and design uh, by following them? You know, there are also, you know, it can be a lot of fun and you might also change uh, in, in a transformative a lot if uh, you consider if there is a mega trend. How can I design the counter mega trend? So, just giving an example, you know, will only mega cities, uh, like uh, everybody is telling us, be the home of our homes in the future? We know that we have a couple of problems in uh, that uh, mega trend. By 2030, there will be 5 billion city dwellers. We will have uh, to build homes for 1 million population per week over the next 15 years to, <laughs> to get uh, that target uh, of giving a home to all of them. Of course, you know, with the uh, uh, today's conventional technologies uh, that will be something that will end, at end our planet. And on top of that, uh, we know that 3 billion people are living, uh, who are living in the cities today, 1 billion are under the line of poverty. And in 2030, there will be 2 billion. So the humanitarian and ecological scenario, you know, catastrophic scenario that this implies is something that I think we have to take care of. Rem Kolhas, fantastic architect, uh, uh, one of the main architects of my generation, he, he was already launching this message in one of his last essays. He said, we were saying the countryside is, not, uh, is now the front line of the transformation that we should uh, design. You know? Our current obsession with only the city is highly irresponsible because you cannot understand the city without understanding the countryside. So, I brought with me another project that I think it is interesting uh, to look at. It's just, uh, you know, a micro idea that could uh, be inspiring for you.
So you see, this is uh, something that, uh, you know, is uh, starting to explore what are the in-between spaces, you know, between the, the two dimension of the extreme dimension of the mega cities on one side and the countryside uh, on the other side. What can be really, you know, designed in the middle of these two notion of our of the contents uh, where we understand our homes are being based. And plus, uh, you know, I think that they respond to, on one side, the movement uh, that is, uh, you know, growing, uh, that is the movement of co-housing, uh, and also a trend, uh, because we know that more and more people are, you know, living together in the same home, multiple generation homes are growing. So, uh, okay, let's go into the next step, which is uh, see what are the ongoing uh, paradigm shifts, uh, real paradigm shifts, things that are culturally changing our value set. But I think that the biggest uh, paradigm shift that we have been uh, uh, not only observing but being part of is exactly this, you know, the, the, the dematerialization of our, <laughs> our stuff, you know, the idea that we don't know to own things, but we can share things. This is a paradigm shift from a point of view of the dominant uh, logic of our cultural belief, you know. Shifting from having to sharing, wow, it's been a real quantum leap, you know, of our societies. The whole consumption, uh, consumeristic uh, uh, idea was instead uh, based on competing with each other for having more stuff. And so how, how, what happens, you know, if we are bringing this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this battlefield, you know, of who owns more, you know, into, you know, this dimension of having a, a sense of our home as something extended, uh, like uh, Marcus was telling us before, that is part of this collaborative w network. But this is really a paradigm shift because it's shifting, you know, what all, <laughs> all what our... Western societies has, have always been about, you know, the me, myself, I, into this next uh, horizon of the we. So the, if the me, myself, I was part of the problem, you know, I is it possible that this big cultural shift is taking us to the solution of many of our problems into this we dimension? So I think this is a real paradigm shift uh, that is already ongoing. Fourth, Designing a new dream. The scale deep uh, can be based uh, on uh, designing a new dream. A new dream transformation happens uh, when you have a dystopian dream behind you that doesn't, doesn't fix, uh, fit uh, to, to, to your ideals, to what you're expecting from life. Uh, and it is, uh, of course, a dream uh, if it, it, it take, uh, uh, taking you to transformation that not only is desirable, but it is actionable. So let, in order to go in that direction, understand what is and was the old dream. Okay, the old dream was a dream that we all embraced because uh, it was coming after a, 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 a time of wars and uh, violence uh, that was making our Western society, you know, putting them to the ground zero. And it came from this dream, uh, the sunshine <laughs> came from West. It was the American dream, you know, and uh, uh, it was the, the ticket to the paradise that of a promise better life based on material wealth, social uh, ladder, 
homes uh, for everybody, consum consumption for everybody. And it was a dream uh, that conquered our body, mind, and spirit at the rhythm of Boogie Woogie with uh, you know, the seduction of uh, Hollywood, the taste of Coca-Cola and Marlboro cigarettes. And of course, a dream that connected the whole world with the promise of conspicuous consumption and affluency for all. A dream that slowly fast uh, delocated jobs uh, in the emerging countries, a dream uh, of consumerism that spread our Western lifestyle worldwide, and uh, with all that, uh, you know, the world GDP, the population and the technological development grew exponentially. These are the 50s and these was just, uh, you know, a few years ago. And so, of course, it did uh, also grow our environmental footprint. On the other side, globalization lifted millions of people out of poverty. The losers are today the poorest uh, and the Western middle class. The super winners are, of course, uh, the super rich. So we have now a problem in distribution of wealth. How will the democratic design of the homes of the futures of millions of migrants look like? We know that in the next 10 years, we will have 25 million of new Europeans who will need a home. So I'm speaking about uh, just uh, migrants that legally will enter Europe. So this is, uh, of course, creating in all of us fear. No, there is the possibility to close the door, react against something that is for sure going to help and understand it as a nightmare, as the end <laughs> of uh, the dream, you know, that we were just going through. The end of this dream of the home for all, you know, in affluent societies that is already on that level, you know, people not even being able to afford, you know, of the middle class that dream. But the, the, the end of this dream is also getting other countries on the other side of the world. It's not only about Western, Western societies, you know, because even in Asian countries, you know, uh, you're drinking water that is polluted, uh, you are breathing air that is very toxic. There is an op a fantastic uh, lady, Peggy Liu, that is an activist in China. She says China needs to care its own Chinese dream the way to a thriving life and stable community, a path that is a sustainable path. If we don't do so, and so, we will end up with a China nightmare, what will be a global nightmare, of course. So, what has all that to do with design? So we have to do, that all has to do this, the, with design, because let, let, let's start a little bit uh, from the beginning and l allow me to use the, 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 the metaphor of Walt Disney culture, no? since we are talking about uh, the American dream. So design in Cinderella times uh, was the, the engineering tool for addressing people's needs. Design for Cinderella becoming a princess times became the marketing tool for addressing people's aspiration. Design for Alice in Wonderland, Wonderland times uh, became the experiential tool uh, for addressing people's most dreamlike uh, whims and wishes. Hypersaturated markets push design to the ultimate border of extreme hallucinations. So design became the tool for reaching the stuff occasion of our homes, making a choice today among the overabundance of stuff. All designed stuff uh, has become a nightmare. And design is now becoming the digitalization tool for addressing people's helplessness. 50 billion devices will be online in 2020, is Cisco. And I had the chance a lot of two weeks ago to, to, to meet here in Switzerland at the Gottlieb Dutweiler Institute, Amber Case, 
who is an anthropologist and a technologist uh, that has been uh, writing this very interesting book about calm technology. Her point is very important, is, uh, is an alarm, uh, is a warning, you know. She said that we have to make sure that, uh, you know, that uh, the technologies that we are going to embrace and welcome in our homes uh, are not going to dictate our life uh, and our schedule because we are not doing things by ourselves. She said also, watch out, because uh, the technology today is easily mal bad functioning, malfunctioning. And uh, if they don't work properly, these devices, uh, we would have big problems you know, <laughs> at our homes. And uh, of course, she said, intruders can always get around home security. So they are not secure, they are not safe. So in a dystopian world, we would uh, become too dependent on technology causing us to lack necessary skills for survival. On the other side, also politicians that were taking care of consumer rights in, in the past, uh, before this is uh, Edith uh, Ramirez, uh, former chairwoman of the US Federal Trade Commission, they also warn us about uh, the, the dimension, the risk uh, in terms of citizens uh, and civil society, you know, that uh, these devices uh, could represent. If we don't program them right at the beginning, you know, the big mistakes come from the very beginning. So if we don't want to be welcome in this uh, dystopian uh, digital world, you know, we have to think about, and uh, probably also from a cultural point of view, to create some kind of provoking and thoughtful idea about also what we don't want, you know, in the future to become our home. I think that it is very interesting what the, in this school, in, in the Hara Design Institute, they, they, they created as an installation of the home of the future. You know, a one family under a wireless roof. Each one of them connected with their virtual reality home. Okay? So, it would be so nice if something made sense for a chance. So, transformation starts uh, with all what creates new meaningfulness, a new sense of purpose, new aspirations, and new dreams. Uh, just briefly, I want to tell you that just a few days ago, weeks ago, the association of the Jungian, Jungian as Association in Italy came out with a publication that I found very interesting. Because they tell us, uh, you know, that uh, even, you know, in their clinic uh, psychotherapies, uh, you know, they see a big shift at the moment. You know, people are not going to get a psychotherapy treatment uh, because uh, as it was in the past, they have problem, you know, to relate to the others, but more and more because they have problem to relate with themselves. Huh? And uh, the other interesting thing is that, uh, since we are talking about Jungian uh, uh, psychoanalysis, uh, that more and more people relate and report uh, about the dreams uh, of earthquakes, floods, uh, Marshals, and, and they are all signalizing the risk of possible collapse and catastrophes. Okay? And this is something interesting because the, our colleagues in the uh, clinic uh, uh, psychology say this is probably the first sign of a profound renewal. This is probably the beginning of the need to create new utopias and what are the resources that we need in order to enable that uh, new utopias to, to start? Of course, you know, we all, all agree. In dystopian times, you need utopia. And please, don't think uh, that utopias uh, are things that don't happen. Because utopias happened in the past of humanity. Abolition of slavery universal suffrage, gay marriage, uh, borders abolition, they were all utopias. So utopia is not what is not possible, is has no space where to happen. The problem is to not go in retro utopias. This is uh, Zygmunt Bauman, one of the most fantastic thinkers of, the, of our times that died just recently. His last uh, present uh, was this book about uh, how 
you know, his warning to not go into retro utopias because they are only representing, meaning uh, fleeing from uh, the future and propose, uh, they propose reality that will never come back. So, fifth, redesign, design. I think that designers understand, understood as innovators, they are the new avant craft of the future. And designers in that sense are also people, you know, working in business, you know, it's not just as you remember from the very be begin beginning, you know, who is studying design. Avant crafters that are embracing social innovation. That means avant crafters that really go down out uh, in the world, you know, and understand that, that the real innovation that is happening is happening down in the real world. You know, the transition network and the transformative movement uh, that is happening in the world doesn't get into the radar of the media because, you know, good news never are good news, you know, for media people. But, sorry, eh, Annie, <laughs> you're probably different, but it's true, you know, that, uh, you know, this good news, uh, you know, don't get into our area of perception, but they exist. There are lots of fantastic research that have been done also by designers, you know, you know, design universities that have been understanding that there is a big movement out there that is deeply transforming our world and is not made by big people, but is made by ordinary people doing smaller things together. They are getting uh, energy ownership and self-sufficiency. They are creating the whole food uh, value chain uh, together. They are mm, repairing things. They are sharing things. They are, you know, you name it. Uh, you know, they are also, and this is very important, creating a new alliance with the countryside. So this happy community, this ha movement made of communities is growing. And I think that if we translate that into what does that mean for the home of the future, you know, I think that, uh, you know, this love for my furniture, you know, is shifting <laughs> for the love of the people that I share uh, my home with. The idea of my love for my home is shifting into the love of my extended home. Like uh, Marcos was saying, my neighborhood, my city, my village, my planet home. So my family is not the family only of my friends and my neighbors and my FB, uh, Facebook friends, but it's also the human family on our planet home. So this community, this movement, uh, this invisible movement is growing and is the movement of we the world of we. What is very, very diverse. In fact, the only thing that unites this movement is the diversity. They don't have an ideology. They don't have one leader. They are all diverse. But what they have in common? Resiliency, ingenuity. They are the people who have stopped to say no, this, no, that, uh, you know. They say yes and they do things. And they are makers and dreamers together. And the movement of artists and designers that are contributing, mingling, embracing this movement is also growing immensely and in a very interesting way. To bring more possibility, enjoyable, desirable possibility for this movement to grow. And of course, in many ways, from bringing people to eat, uh, you know, together what is, has been all uh, cooked uh, by using the waste of a city, food waste of a city, to, you know, embellishing the peripheral parts of cities that are otherwise going to become even more dangerous uh, than ever. So, the future, if we want to have a future, is no longer about doing less harm, reducing uh, our negative impact uh, on the planet and on the, p the people. It's about doing more good by design. You know that uh, in recently, you know, in, uh, in the international exhibition of movie in, uh, in, uh, in, in Venice, uh, uh, this movie was uh, opening, the, uh, showed at the opening of the, of the festival. And it was 
called The Downsizing, uh, no? is the title of this movie. So the, thing, the story is, as it is right now, as we can compute the situation of our world, that right now we cannot man manage to th see any future. So the only possibility is that we reduce human beings to five inches. And we make everything happen as it is right now. We don't change anything in the system. We don't have to transform anything else but the size of human being. And then we will be happy again. So, very old myths, you know? Remember Lilliput and uh, how Swift also turned everything in that sense to a tragedy. And so happens also in downsizing. The idea is a stupid one, it doesn't work. Why? Because downsizing nonsense is not the solution. Downsizing uh, less harmfulness is not the solution. Democratic transformative design is the tool for building a new utopia, home for all and forever. And for doing that, I want to finish my talk by just proposing you that. After the dictate of design of the past, form follows function, and form follows fiction, time has come for, for form following meaningfulness. And in that way, we will make it to scale deep uh, a new dream for durable transformation. And we can make it because uh, if we find the key to unlock people's hearts and minds, we will make history. We will lead the way. We will thrive forever on a flourishing planet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Simonetta. Um, when we hear all this, what appears to me is that finally, at the end, even though there are a lot of problems and big problems in the area we are living now and we are experiences, experiencing everybody every day in, in, ev in our everyday life, uh, these big challenges, this is a message of hope that you just gave. Absolutely. You know, the, the, in spite of uh, the very pe dark, <laughs> pessimistic uh, picture that, uh, in the, especially in the last uh, year, you know, our world um, was trapped in, uh, you know, no, the, the, the possibility is always there, you know, and there for the hope, uh, for something that uh, will keep humanity developing for the better. And if, tell me if I'm wrong, but if I get it right, we are all creators, and yes. so we are all designers. Yes, <laughs> and that's you the got way it. we have uh, to yes. see it, right? Absolutely, I do agree that. Okay, I perfect. Absolutely, I do agree with it. We are all designers. Okay, and that's. I think that's the message I have to pass on, and we can't go further because we are already a bit um, too late. So thank you very okay, much, Simone. Thank you very Sorry much. Sorry for the Q and A. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.